Uh, we have, as our, as our title suggests, uh, not just three disparate topics, but three uh, wonderful speakers addressing uh, these, these fields. What they have in common is uh, not just their, their talent, of course, but uh, their uh, having been uh, friends and interlocutors of, of Barry uh, for uh, many years. Uh, and second, their own uh, vital scholarship, which has its own uh, commitment to unfolding, to process, uh, to ever new inquiries. Um, if I were to introduce them properly, the, our time would be gone. So I would just say a, a sentence or two about, about each. Uh, Michel Chaudy, uh, our first speaker, is professor of German and comparative literature at the University of Indiana. Uh, Michel uh, does not waste his time on small topics. He's written uh, a book called The Laboratory of Poetry, Chemistry and Poetics in the Work of Cleveland Schlegel. Uh, and followed that up this last year uh, with a wonderful new book, Thinking with Kant's Critique of Judgment. Now, if you look at just the titles of these books, Laboratory Thinking, you get a sense of the commitment to, uh, to process, to uh, sort of the ongoing uh, development of a, of a conversation, of a, of a discourse. Our second speaker, uh, Noah Feldman, teaches us moderators why we should never write up our comments until a few minutes before uh, the panel begins. Because I uh, stumbled down this morning, opened my New York Times, uh, as I always do, to the op-ed page. Uh, and there was Noah uh, giving a uh, presentation, a column on uh, social media, especially Twitter, and uh, the Bill of Rights. Incisive, nuanced, capturing in a few uh, words the complexity of this problem. Uh, apart from that, he's written a number of books, uh, most recent of which is The Three Lives of James Madison, Genius, Partisan, President. Uh, he's advertised uh, by the law school as a constitutional uh, specialist. Uh, but we have to take constitutional here very, very broadly uh, because he's concerned not just with the American Constitution but with other nations as well uh, in both theoretical and practical fashion. Uh, and his range of learning is prodigious, uh, ranging from the biblical to classical Islamic uh, to all sorts of contemporary fields. He is uh, Felix Frankfurter, Professor of Law uh, here at Harvard, also uh, Director of the Jewish Rabinowitz uh, Program on uh, Jewish and Israeli Law. Rabinowitz, excuse me. Our third speaker uh, is the Will E. York, Professor of Physics here at Harvard. This is Andy Strominger. Uh, I don't know whether anyone has ever called him Andrew. I never have. Um, but uh, Andy is remarkable for his, his work in theoretical physics, especially in string theory, uh, in which we have discoursed, as he's patiently tried for the last 25 years or so, uh, to explain this um, approach to a unified theory of the, of the universe. Uh, and he's also worked on black holes. Um, he's developed uh, along the way, and of course his work is very theoretical, very cutting edge, but a marvelous talent for giving public presentations on these subjects. So these are our three panelists. Each will have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, that will give us some time for uh, questions and, and discussions. Uh, and I'm not prepared to be too ruthless with the clock because Three such brilliant people can surely count to 20. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, Gretchen and Barry are very moved to be here. Uh, I always thought of uh, Barry as leading 
uh, a, a kind of poetic existence. Um, and, and it occurred to me that, the, uh, that, that one important feature of a poetic existence, maybe the most important, is not just to bring forth something new, but to allow others to bring forth something. It is to be, um, to be a kind of facilitator or inspirer or midwife uh, of, uh, of, of others' activity, which is exactly how he was working in my imagination as I was writing. So this talk uh, is really a way of uh, trying to get <clears throat> at, um, at this idea of, of what it means to have a poetic existence and what the, um, the relationship is between um, creativity or creation uh, of oneself and that of, uh, that of others. The title is The Truth Told Urgently, which I chose before Maria's, before I learned of Maria's research that this is, this, the idea of urgency is, is important to you, Barry, that it makes perfect, perfect sense. There's a fragment by Friedrich Schlegel that has stuck with me for the past 25 years or so, since I came across it as a student. Actually, it's just a line from a fragment, and it keeps returning to me out of nowhere and under unlikely circumstances, for example, while doing sit-ups or fixing lunch. And when it does, I do not quite know what to make of it. It's a line you may know from a collection that Schlegel, all of 25 years old, and well on his way to becoming one of the, uh, perhaps the leading theorists <coughs> of literature in Germany and possibly Europe, when Schlegel published it in 1797. In translation, it reads, poetry can only be criticized by poetry. That's it. Poetry can only be criticized by poetry. Poesie kann nur durch Poesie kritisiert werden. And basically, it's just with this one line that I would like to gain some closeness. It puts two terms, poésie and critique, poetry and critique or criticism, in relation to one another. It tell, tells us something we already know, namely that critique or criticism orients itself towards poetry. But it also says that this orientation towards poetry must itself be poetic. And here we find ourselves at sea. We are to think of criticism as poetic, but our imagination falters. Are we to think that the work of some of the great critics is a form of poetry, the work, say, of William Empson or Erich Auerbach, of Peter Sondi, or any other critic, um, <coughs> favorite critic that you may wish to add? As Schlegel uses the term here and elsewhere, poetry is not restricted to a genre such as the lyric, nor even to verbal artworks in general, but reaches for the essence of productive making itself, whatever form it might take. Still, what was Schlegel himself a poet when he wrote about Lessing or Goethe? Is the fragment asking us to change our conception of poetry or of criticism, or perhaps of both? Or is Schlegel mistaken here. Before we get tied up in knots, let's follow the line. What it says is plain. Poetry can only be criticized by poetry. Poetry is where I set out, and poetry is where I end, my dwelling and my destination. Though I may not know its dimensions, nor the measure of its boundaries, I do not face in it an alien thing but rather something with which I maintain an unknown intimacy. I tend to approach it as though it were an unidentified substance that must be probed from a distance with a stick of scholarly analysis, but then I forget that I can know it only if I know it from inside, even when its meaning confounds me. In fact, I forget that, it meaning, that its meaning confounds me the way poetry does because I know it from inside. Knowing it from inside does not mean that it harbors no mysteries. 
It means that poetry is not an object to be studied, dissected, and decoded. It is, in fact, no object at all. That, too, is something the fragment intimates. When poetry encounters poetry, the two do not occupy opposite poles. Here, I, the reading subject, somehow deploying poetry, there, a poetic object that I approach and seek to understand, with criticism somehow coursing between us. If criticism itself is done by poetry, as Schlegel puts it, then poetry is the medium through which I move, not a thing that I hold before me. To do criticism, criticism by poetry names something intimate, not a theory or a method, but a form of comportment. <laughs> what kind of criticism res responds to this intimacy in comportment? We know the answer, the way that takes the path of poetry. This is not the poetry exhausted by markers of genre or convention, as I said. It is a more general phenomenon. In one of his lectures, Schlegel describes it as a kind of thinking. There is, he says, there is a kind of thinking that produces something. He calls this thinking the making of poetry. This German word is just das Dichten, which, as he says, creates its material itself. Seen this way, the key characteristic of poetry is not beauty, not truth, not pleasure, though all of these may well be involved, but it is a productivity in thinking itself. Productive thinking, we now see, must also be the mark of any form of criticizing that seeks the intimacy of poetry. Criticism, then, is poetic when its way of thinking produces something, when it makes something new, some <coughs> new speech. Even if it has been uttered before, such an act of spe speaking will be something unheard of. Ideas that have grown flaccid gain fresh vigor, like a muscle that one learns to feel in you. Yet this speaking emerges not out of thin air, but follows upon another act, this an act of hearing, an act as daring as the speech to which it gives rise. For to hear poetically, to hear that I may speak, as Emerson puts it, demands of me to open not my ears alone, but also myself, to allow myself to be exposed to what speaks to me, unshielded by my usual armaments, with effects I cannot foresee. This self-exposure, this becoming vulnerable, lies at the core of poetic criticism, I think. At first, it is difficult to see where this space may be found in which criticism would unfold its productivity, since reading Schlegel, one can get the sense that the artwork has so thoroughly commandeered all creative force that little more is left for criticism to do than recapitulating, re-experiencing, reflecting on the work done by the artwork. Wilhelm Meister, uh, uh, one of the um, great novels by Goethe, uh, Wilhelm Meister Schlegel claims in his exemplary essay on this novel, and I quote, fortunately is one of those books that judge themselves. It stands to reason then that it, that it is also a book that, as Schlegel writes, one can learn to understand only through itself. In that case, the, there does not seem to be much room left uh, to the critic. Though, as I say this, doubts arise. The German leaves it open whether the understanding is realized in the work itself or in the reader. Dieses Buch, welches man nur aus sich selbst verstehen lernen kann, allows for both options. It could be a book that one can learn to understand only through itself, or else a book that one can learn to understand only through one's own self. The way to resolve this issue is to recognize that understanding entails both reader and work, and that what appears split into two locations guided by distinct formal principles, 
the critic or reader or subject on the one hand, the work or object on the other, is in fact one and the same process involving the two. We can look to the Romantic archive for more textured ways of describing this logic. Thus, thus there is another fragment by Schlegel that states in part, what is essential is to be able immediately to idealize and at the same time to realize objects, to complete them and in part to carry, carry them out within oneself. To complete them translates ergänzen, which literally means to make whole. Why is this essential? Again, we know the answer, for the fragment has pointed the way, this time with its own form. The work stands in need of being made whole because it is incomplete, it is not fully realized, it is fragmentary. This idea is best known in its mirrored version, another well-known fragment sings the praises of what Schlegel calls infinitely progressive universal poetry, and it is easy to see why the expression of such an exalted idea would become the most frequently cited text of Jena for early Romanticism. But the idea of infinite becoming is just the flip side of never becoming, of irredeemable incompletion. There is within the infinity of the work of art and opacity, a point at which the work is insufficient to itself and therefore calls to the reader to carry it out, to make it whole. No poet, no artist of any art, has his complete meaning alone. That's T.S. Eliot, a little more than a century after the writings I've been using as my point of departure, and a little less than a century before our own moment. What this thought means for the critic, we learn in an especially concise way from Novalis, ordinarily less shrewd than his collaborator Friedrich Schlegel. The true reader, he notes, must be the enlarged author. The true reader must be the enlarged author, which leads the critic Walter Benjamin to conclude that, quote, for the Romantics, criticism is much less the evaluation of a work than it is the method of its completion or of its fulfillment. Benjamin refashions the concept of criticism. Instead of judging the work, criticism completes it. That's interesting. But even that may be promising too much. If the criticism of poetry can only be accomplished by poetry, then the opacity that we noted in the work of art, its essential incompleteness, will also be a feature of criticism. The enlarged author, too, does not have his complete meaning alone. Benjamin makes it sound as though two incompletions join to form a completion. But I do not set out with a hole in myself and then seek something, a poem, say, that might help plug it up nor do I spot a lack in a work that I then rush to fill. It's not up to me to mend a fragment nor to make amends for it. On the contrary, the fact that I fail to have my complete meaning alone is not a knowledge that I possess. Rather, it is only revealed to me as I work to understand a book, a fragment, or a painting through itself. That is what opens the way to practicing reading as a form of self-exposure or of becoming vulnerable. How to imagine this practice of becoming vulnerable? It may help to shift to another art form and another medium and recall how certain paintings ask of the viewer to take a certain stance or a certain distance and a certain relation to light. I can, of course, decide to stand inches from the canvas, but in that case, I see brush strokes not the painting. Or I gaze at it from the far end of the hall, and then I recognize the vague arrangements of shapes and colors. Part of what I do in a gallery, as I move about, eyes fixed on a painting, is to find out where it wants me to stand. Sometimes I find it right away. At other times, it takes several approaches. And then there are times when the spot eludes me, for which I often blame the painting. 
Would it make sense to say that giving myself over to a work, looking to become the enlarged author, seeking to carry out the work in myself, describe ways of searching for a place from which I can read the work and it can read me? I think it does. Criticism involves, above all, not a way of un uncovering a hidden meaning in an object, but rather a process in which I experience something that exceeds my own capacities. Becoming vulnerable means not a momentary ecstasy, but a process involving a change that may endure, or one whose exact outlines may remain obscure to me for a long time, perhaps forever. The true force of a reading, the most profound way in which it occasions a change in my world, is often not transparent to myself, which is why a phrase from a poem or a fragment, a patch of light uh, in a painting or a line of music can come to haunt me. It may seem as though reading understood as a practice of becoming vulnerable could only happen in a sudden flash. When I say that I may be seized by an artwork or that I find myself called to it, I seem, I seem to encourage the idea that it is the sort of thing that simply and unaccountably happens, like love at first sight or a slap in the face. It's a notion that somebody like Franz Kafka furthers in a well-known letter that he writes a childhood friend. Let me read you a portion from this remarkable letter. In general, Kafka writes, in general, I think we should read only books that bite and sting us. If the book we are reading doesn't wake us like a blow to the skull, why bother reading the book? So that it can make us happy, as you put it? Good God, we'd be just as happy if we had no books at all. Books that make us happy we could, in a pinch, also write ourselves. This is Kafka writing. <laughs> what we need are books, he continues, what we need are books that hit us like a misfortune, that pains us deeply, like the death of someone we love more than we love ourselves, that make us feel as though we have been banished to the woods, far from human, from any human presence, like suicide. And he concludes, a book must be the ax for the frozen sea within us. The passage is, I find, very difficult to resist. Itself a blow to the skull, it gives voice to a longing for an experience of reading whose raw intensity flares up in an instant. The images Kafka conjures tempt us because they flatter art for its force and thus also ourselves for craving and feeling that force. But they understate my work in opening myself to receive such a blow. How to describe the intermediate zone in which I'm neither fully passive nor fully active, which is just the zone of vulnerability to the sense works of art make? The phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty offers an analogy apropos of a different experience. What happens, he asks, when I try to fall asleep. Other than in exceptional cir circumstances, I am not felt by sleep against my volition. Nor can I, as insomniacs, insomniacs can attest, simply will its arrival. Instead, I put myself into a position in which I may receive sleep. True, I do not put, my, I do not put myself to sleep, but rather fall asleep which registers this loss of willing and control, yet I do not usually fall asleep the way that a brick falls to the ground. Rather, I allow myself to fall. I put myself into a position so that this falling can befall me. <coughs> this getting into the right place or getting into position is itself not something that just happens to me, but is rather something that I need to learn. In fact, it can take years of practice of finding the right rituals, clutching the right objects, drifting into the right reveries to learn, some, to, to, learn to do something as seemingly simple and natural as falling asleep. Some of us, perhaps most of us, never master it. 
The phenomenology of falling asleep is an apt analogy, I think, for criticism because it gives contour to the murky zone between activity and passivity that characterizes the emphatic experience of reading. It also reveals how much elaboration and cultivation, how much learning is required to unfold such an experience. If we think of reading as a way of rendering oneself vulnerable, then we should think of this vulnerability neither as something I just suffer, nor as something I will, but as something I achieve, something I carry out in Schlegel's terms. Self-exposure, while not subject to hard and fast rules, is also not an arbitrary process. I don't merely stumble around the gallery or the text, hoping somehow to hit the right spot. Rather, my movements have been shaped by learning and practice, which do help me, though there is no guarantee of success. Being struck dumb by a passage in Schlegel can result from inattention or incomprehension or stupidity. But it may also happen after years of study. In that case, the muteness will have a different texture, sharper and more baffling. I'll conclude by saying something about the personal pronoun I, which I've used liberally. Saying that in authentic criticism I, the reader, have to put myself at stake may make it sound as though criticism must be confessional. But that's not what I mean. In fact, quite the contrary. Self-exposure is not the same thing as self-confession or self-discovery. It may be closest to self-annihilation, a term Schlegel often uses though I don't feel I quite understand what he means by it. One of the effects of exposing myself to the work of art, of rendering myself vulnerable to its force, is that prompts me to give up my idiosyncratic tendencies, my likes and dislikes, my appetites and wants, laying open something impersonal in me. And here too, the work demanded of the critic is like what the poet performs. Emerson says of the poet that, I quote, the deeper he dives into the privatist, secretist presentiment, to his wonder he finds this is the most acceptable, the most public, and universally true. For Eliot, poetry, and I quote again, is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape for, from personality. And being Eliot, he adds, but of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from those things. The poet Paul Celan renders the thought in the most concise form I know. Art creates ego distance. Art creates ego distance. Kunst schafft Ichferne. What is impersonal in me is most public and universally true, not in the way science or Wissenschaft aspires to being public and universally true, but by laying bare those moments where I'm a stranger to myself, where what I feel and understand and say remains opaque to myself. If a literary work is worth reading, it's worth losing one's way in. We write and give talks and teach, and in all this busyness, we allow ourselves to forget that there are real risks involved. The serious writer must play with fire, Iris Murdoch has said. If that's right, then it cannot be the task of serious readers to play the part of the firefighters or to confine themselves to measuring the temperature or classifying the flames. They must get close. Otherwise, why bother? Thank you for your attention. So what, what I would like to do uh, today is to speak about a, a concrete problem. It's concrete in an institutional sense, because that's what I do when I do constitutional law. But it derives from an abstract question connected to the nature of truth itself, uh, which is very much the kind of question that Barry and I were struggling with in the class. So to do that, let me just start with a passage that is probably familiar to many of you. It goes like this. Let truth and falsehood grapple. Who ever knew truth to be put to the worse in a free and open encounter? Thus far, John Milton, 
in his uh, very famous and influential essay, Areopagitica. Now, I, I thought about subtitling my talk, John Milton Meet Vladimir Putin, <laughs> because this claim that in a free and open encounter uh, between truth and false, truth will not be put to the worse, is open to at least two obvious different interpretations. In one interpretation, it's an empirical claim about the world. And if it's an empirical claim about the world, it contains within it also an institutional recommendation. And indeed, that is how Milton presents it in context. If you think that when truth and false contend, the truth will emerge as the victor, that is an argument for precisely the free and open encounter that Milton is suggesting. Namely, we should value institutionally a norm of the freedom of speech as the derivative conclusion of an initial proposition about the world, empirical and in theory perhaps testable, that when truth and falsehood grapple, the truth will win. Now, if that's the case, we have to deal with the Putin problem, uh, which is just a shorthand for the problem that I think we face much more broadly in this country and elsewhere today. Namely, it's very doubtful whether as an empirical matter this claim is accurate. Under many conditions, truth and falsehood appear to grapple, and falsehood appears to win. Now, there's another way out of this problem, which is to say Milton must have meant something different. Milton was, of course, a deeply religious person, a deeply religious writer. He may be speaking not so much empirically descriptively, as idealistically, normatively. He may simply be hoping, or aspiring, or believing as a matter of faith that in this encounter, truth will win. And he may be appealing to an audience that was also deeply religious, and therefore found it easier to commit itself to claims like this without worrying so much about whether they were empirically testable. I think the latter is very possibly the better interpretation of Milton in context, but today I'm going to focus on the first possible approach to Milton, namely the empirical uh, and institutional vision, because it turns out that Milton's idea has been crucially formative in our ideas about the freedom of speech. And that's my real topic today. So first I'm going to say a few words trying to explore why someone might believe Milton's view empirically. And then I'm going to turn to three modern, roughly speaking, attempts to answer the question of when and how speech should be regulated in order to assure that it is free in such a way that the truth wins. And just to set the stakes clearly, the reason this matters is that if we look around the world today, I take it that everyone in the room has a prior intuitive preference for freedom of speech, and uh, maybe that's a false assumption, but I'll, I'll take it, I'll be charitable and take it. And I take it also that many of us are genuinely worried about what to do in a world where the conditions that are meant to facilitate truth emerging from freedom of speech seem not to be producing that result in a range of different contexts. Okay, so first the exploration. So why might one think that when truth and falsehood grapple, truth will win. Well, one possibility is that one is defining truth in that context as demonstrative truth. That is to say, the kind of thing that is susceptible to rational demonstration that would have to be accepted by every other rational person. And we can imagine domains of proof that work this way. Uh, my mathematics might well count as a domain in which a rational demonstration, correctly performed by a rational person, presented to other rational people possessed of the appropriate tools, ought to yield the same result. So juxtapose false reasoning, that is to say fallacious reasoning, with accurate true reasoning, and you ought to eventually produce a victory for the view that counts as demonstrative truth. If we were solely dealing in the realm of purely demonstrative truths, that might be enough. And one way to understand Milton's claim is to say that he's talking about realms like that. And maybe he also believes that moral truth functions in the same way that demonstrative truth functions. He might actually hold a view like that. Today, it's hard to hold that view. Even uh, moral theorists who believe uh, very much in right answers to moral questions, typically don't think that the right answer to a moral question is true in the same sense 
that the right answer to a mathematical problem or even a problem in physics would be. I should say parenthetically, um, the other panels today have all been models of useful interaction and communication. I don't know how well we'll do on our panel, but I will try, since I'm sandwiched in the middle between uh, philosophy and physics, I will try to make a few points that are, that are uh, at least oblique to each. So here I would just give you the example of uh, uh, the great philosopher, the late great philosopher Ronald Dworkin's attempt to explain why moral truth is a little different from truth in, say, physics. And he said, what would it, what would, if truth were made up of, moral truths were made up of particles, you know, what, what would you call them? Um, he said, well, you know, the idea of morons maybe leaves to mind. <laughs> So, but Milton may have believed that moral truth was demonstrable in something like the way we think of mathematical or, or physical truths. But again, to contemporary thinkers, uh, certainly uh, those more inclined, Dworkin was himself a, a moral realist, and even he did not think it was the same sort of truth. And the demonstration of rightness was the same sort of demonstration that would take place in uh, the mathematical or physical sciences. Others who incline towards more, more relativistic conceptions of truth, and I'm going to talk about a few of those in a moment, certainly don't think that truth can function in the same sort of way. And so for them, again, it becomes much more difficult to assume that in the dispute between truth and falsehood, truth will always come out the winner. So let me now introduce three institutional solutions that have been proposed each of which is tied to a theory of speech, and each of which is, I think, also tied to a theory of truth. These are all products of the 20th century, although they start pretty early in the 20th century. Uh, the first theory is associated with Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., um, the, uh, the great Supreme Court Justice, and a uh, close contemporary, uh, both of uh, Benjamin Peirce and of uh, William James, and a fellow traveler in their uh, invert their, their different versions of pragmatism, small p philosophical pragmatism. Holmes introduced a metaphor in a Supreme Court opinion, which we know as the metaphor of the marketplace of ideas. And Holmes's idea, in essence, was that if one treats ideas as objects for sale in a marketplace, then the market will clear. That is to say, the true view will be the one adopted by the greatest majority of people in the market. Now, Holmes, even in this opinion, left a crucial ambiguity between two different versions of this marketplace metaphor. And it's an ambiguity that actually still exists in treatments of this metaphor to this day. And I should say that this metaphor is regularly invoked in judicial opinions to this day, even though it's all coming up on a century old. The ambiguity is between a view that says that it is the way marketplaces work and consistent with a small p pragmatist account of truth, that because life is an experiment, as Holmes says in the same, in a, same opinion, we will experimentally abandon ideas that don't work for us, come up with the ideas that do work for us, and therefore the probability is very high that we will converge on something that looks like the truth. That's the modest version of uh, Holmes's pragmatism in the marketplace of ideas. There's a more radical relativist version, according to which Holmes might actually be saying, a little bit sub rosa, that it's useless to speak of truth with a capital T at all. All we can do is look at a given society and see what it converges upon in believing is the truth, and that's the best we can ever do, and that's the truth. And so the marketplace is then a self-fulfilling picture in the way that sometimes the theory of natural selection is described as tautological. That idea which is, has survived is the most fit, is itself the truth. And that's all we can ever say about truth. That's a more radical, relativist picture of the freedom of speech. Notice that that view is already very far from Milton's. The former view, though, the former version of Holmes's view, might be seen as a real-world, empirical, empiricist, pragmatist attempt to explain why we should believe the truth will win. Because conversation, to connect to the theme of, uh, of today and the theme of the week, conversation functions a bit like an experiment. We put out the good ideas, we knock out the bad ones, and eventually we narrow it down to a view on which we converge. Now on that view, when is it appropriate to regulate the conversation? What speech should not be allowed? 
Well, the simplest answer is that if our dominant metaphor is that of a marketplace, we should regulate when the market would seem to fail. And there are a whole set of circumstances in which we know that markets fail. In a monopoly, market fails. So we ought to make, make sure that we're not in a monopolistic situation where only certain ideas are being offered as in a totalitarian government. Another very important example and directly significant for Holmes is the circumstance where we're not thinking clearly, where, to use more contemporary psychological terminology, the wrong system of thought is being used, hustling us to the bad outcomes rather than thinking slowly, calmly, and rationally. So on this view, Holmes famously said that when there is a clear and present danger posed by a certain form of speech, that speech should be prohibited. So clear and present danger is originally formulated by Holmes as an exception from free speech rules, because when there is a clear and present danger, there is a danger that a crowd, a mob, that's what he's picturing, will, as one and without thinking rationally, engage in some form of dangerous collective action. His great concrete example is when someone falsely shouts fire in a crowded theater. Under those circumstances, no time to be rational, no time to reason, just got to go to the exits. So Holmes says that is the kind of speech that can be prohibited and ought to be prohibited. So the way to think about this is, if you think that truth is obtained through this conversational experimental marketplace model, you must block those forms of speech that break the model of rational, conversational ratiocination. Really thinking things through. If you're not really thinking things through, then that's problematic and should be regulated. Second account. This is an account that was actually first in the United States introduced by Holmes's contemporary, Justice Louis Brandeis. But Brandeis attributed this view to the Founding Fathers with sort of some plausibility, not terribly much plausibility. And it's also a view that was expressed in a much richer form, a much more complex form, later by philosophers like Hannah Arendt. This is the view that ultimately imagines the polity in civic republican terms as a group of citizens who come together to deliberate on common forms of political action. This is a very action-oriented way of thinking about speech. It doesn't primarily focus on ascertaining philosophical truth in the abstract sense. It focuses on ascertaining action-oriented political truth. According to this civic republican view, the point of the freedom of speech is to create the conditions of a community that resolves its most serious questions and debates by conversation, by speaking. And that's the point of the freedom of speech to create a common conversation where we can deliberate, the key word here is generally deliberate, and then of course also vote at the end of that deliberative process. Now, under this view, when is it appropriate to regulate? The answer is you regulate when any condition obtains that would block some of the citizens from participating in a genuine conversation. So imagine that some participants in the conversation are through hate speech or intimidation or other mechanisms blocking other participants in the conversation from fully participating and from fully having their voices heard. Under those circumstances, you can imagine, the Civic Republicans saying that speech can be blocked. Roughly speaking, I should say, this is the view adopted by most Western European democracies in their crafting of freedom of speech. And that's why most such countries prohibit hate speech, prohibit racist speech, prohibit various forms of incitement to violence and racism. This is not restricted to Western democracies, I should say, but it's liberal constitutional democracies around the world typically adopt this view. The United States is a radical outlier, partly because we're more closely connected to the marketplace idea than we are to the civic republican idea. Last, the last and competing idea emerged in the United States in the Supreme Court's doctrine really only in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But the origins of the idea actually go back to Romanticism and actually resonate nicely with certain elements in Michelle's presentation. This romantic view of the freedom of speech thinks that the purpose of freedom of speech is not so much to facilitate a collective experiment or to enable political conversation as to enable the self-realization 
of the individual human. It's to facilitate self-action. And as Michelle was speaking, I was jotting down some terrific passages that actually perfectly capture this. Um, Emerson, I hear that I may speak, just taken directly from Michelle's talk. Notice, I hear, I'm listening to everybody else, that I may speak. But I hear that I may speak. I am expressing myself through that form of speech. Uh, Novalis, the true reader is the enlarged author. Again, from Michelle's talk. That's exactly it. I'm reading, I'm consuming other texts really produced so that I may be the enlarged author that is the author of my own realization. So this is the romantic ideal and it is deeply connected to the self. Michelle closed by mentioning the self. It's deeply connected to the self. This has come to be the dominant strand in contemporary American constitutional thought, almost unacknowledged. Now here's the puzzle, and I'm, I'm very close to, to wrapping up here. If you hold a romantic view of the freedom of speech, when is it proper to regulate speech? If ever. It's a problem. Because if I am engaged in hate speech, that may be necessary to me to be an enlarged author. That may be necessary to my self-realization. Right? Certainly no review of the canon of Western literature would be complete without many, many texts that, it, that include all sorts of sentiments that are harmful to others, that are nasty. Um, books that hit us like a misfortune, Michelle said Kafka, uh, quoted Kafka is asking for. And if a book really hits me like a misfortune, that might limit or cabin my ability to speak. You're suing. But such a book, <laughs> yeah, but such a book, uh, nevertheless, has to be able to be produced under this romantic account. Similarly, if I shout false, if I speak falsely, under the classic marketplace idea, we might actually regulate that under certain circumstances. Not under the self-expression theory. Not under the romantic theory. Falsehood is no bar. I ought to be able to speak falsely. And indeed, several years ago, before fake news, um, or at least before the phenomenon we identify as fake news, I think <laughs> fake news has always been with us, the Supreme Court actually held in a remarkable case called U.S. against Alvarez that false speech is protected by the Constitution. In that case, uh, Alvarez was a serial liar pathological liar who declared that he had won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And there was a federal statute that said it was a crime to say he'd won the Congressional Medal of Honor when you hadn't. And the court struck down the conviction, reversed the conviction, saying that the government lacks the authority under the freedom of speech to criminalize lying about pretty straightforwardly factual matter. Either Congress gave you that medal or they didn't. <laughs> but, but under this romantic account, the self-creation aspect was just as valid if the self-creation was a creation through a falsehood. And we can all certainly appreciate that, certainly those of us who love poetry and, and fiction, and those of us who believe that, you know, uh, as uh, Jamaica Kincaid was, uh, was saying uh, this morning, or was referred to, to saying this morning, that things can be, that they, what she says is true and what she says is not true. So in, from that formulational perspective, it would be absurd to criminalize falsehoods. So that is the source of our present predicament. We are typically so enmeshed in an idea of romantic freedom of expression that we can't work out what would authorize prohibitions on speech that are intended to preserve some account of the truth. Now, um, I would love to say that if I had another 20 minutes, I would now solve this problem for you. And then, unfortunately, time is, no, time is running out. Um, <laughs> It's a good deal more complicated than that, but I will just leave you with a final thought here. One possible, it's not an answer, but one possible institutional approach to a solution is to divide the world into different realms. In some realms, it might never be appropriate for the government to regulate at all. In the true public square, for example, it might never be appropriate for the government to regulate. But there might be some circumstances where it's appropriate not for the government to regulate, but for private actors to regulate certain conversational spaces. A university, for example, would not want to regulate what was said by people who were marching in the yard, because that would seem like a public square where we want to see different views, including false views, expressed. But it might want to have guidelines for what can be said in Science Center B, 
where we think it's appropriate to distinguish between certain utterances that are true or false, and certain utterances that are inclusive or exclusive, or certain utterances that facilitate a common conversation. Now, if that's right, the very easy part is the public space. That's easy. If we get to absolutism there, we never have to worry about making the rules. They can be simple. Anything goes. Inside is where things get much more complicated, where we have to work extraordinarily hard and in a very nuanced, detailed, and case-sensitive way to try to make sure that we facilitate the kind of speech that we need to achieve forms of self-realization, the kind of speech we need for self-governance, and the kind of speech we need for the pursuit of truth including the possibility of identifying certain views as false or less good than other views, while simultaneously not going too far in our restrictions and locking ourselves into modes of conversation that fail to provide the space that we need ultimately to seek after our truth. Thanks. So, uh, since Barry's interested in everything, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, something I'm very interested in myself, especially um, black holes and the information paradox. And I would also like to add, uh, relevant to the, the black holes are true, and they're also very poetic. So um, let me start with um, what is a black hole? On the Earth, it's a little harder. You have to be able to get up to 11 kilometers per second. But once you've done that, you've reached escape velocity, and you can go uh, away from the Earth forever without any, using any more rocket fuel or energy. However, if you have too big of a, too much mass, then the escape velocity becomes of the order of a million kilometers per second, which is the speed of light, and nothing can get out. And that's because Einstein told us that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So if uh, light can't get out, you can't either. <laughs> so that's uh, a black hole. <laughs> now, um, that was actually discovered in the but I, the previous transparency was discussed already in the 19th century. But then Einstein, uh, or Schwarzschild, discovered that the Einstein equation has some solutions which are now recognized as black holes. But the solutions were so subtle, it's, it's kind of hard to grasp this, but the solutions were so subtle and the properties of the black holes so confusing and perplexing that it took 60 years to understand them. And one of the spectacular realizations of this is a paper which Einstein wrote in uh, 1939, saying that black holes didn't exist, which would, he would flunk out of any modern general relativity course for, for having said this. But it's uh, not, he was a very smart character, it's just that black holes are really hard to understand. But now we think we do understand them classically. And moreover, we think there are millions of them up in the sky. And there's one in the middle of the galaxy that's a million kilometers across. And at this moment, we are all in a grand orbit uh, around them. So according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, in which they're described, it's a theory in which space is curved. And the description of a black hole is the space becomes curved, and then it ends, and then there's nothing. Now, when I say nothing, I don't mean like this is empty space. There's actually air here. If I get away from the Earth, I get out, there's no air, and there's a vacuum. But the vacuum is actually a rather lively place. There's lots of stuff in the vacuum. I mean that there is nothing, nothing, nothing. There's not even space inside a black hole. There's nothing in there. And moreover, there were uh, theorems prove um, that there's no information at the boundary here, though the theorems were subtly flawed. 
And there was a slogan that the famous John Wheeler, who was a student of Einstein, uh, invented, that black holes have no hair, meaning they have no distinguishing uh, features. They're all the same. Every empty, every empty hole is the same. Well, that was all fine. So the 70s, 60s and 70s, people really began to understand that black holes existed. They proved, Penrose and Hawking and others, proved theoretically that they had to exist in the real universe, though the astronomical evidence was, was yet to emerge. Uh, and then uh, our, 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 our departed, recently departed dear friend, Stephen Hawking, um, in 1974, asked the question, what happens if you think about black holes in the real world in which things are quantum? Nobody can escape the laws of quantum mechanics, even black holes. And he derived, in a breathtakingly elegant analysis, which seemed to depend on almost nothing, that black holes radiate at a temperature now known as the Hawking temperature, which is given by Planck's constant divided by Newton's constant times the mass of the black hole. So this is the formula for what the temperature, they radiate at a temperature, photons, everything comes out of them at a certain temperature. What the temperature is is a function of the mass. Now, formulas like um, how the temperature depends on the mass were um, the main subject of studies of physicists for several centuries in the 18th and 19th century. They took all the materials and studied how the temperature changes if you add some heat or you change the volume or whatever they do. And they developed what are called the laws of thermodynamics. And then in what is really one of the most beautiful developments in the history of thought, um, Boltzmann said, what if everything is made of molecules? It was a very controversial theory back then. I can derive the behavior of all fluids and gases by just statistical reasoning. And a key ingredient in his statistical reasoning was looking at how many configurations were possible if the energy was fixed in a certain way, or the volume was fixed in a certain way, or the density was fixed in a, in a certain way. And it was a spectacular thing that all the laws of thermodynamics follow from the laws of mathematics, uh, sorry, the assumption of molecules and the laws of mathematics. In other words, uh, mathematics isn't regarded among physicists as an extra assumption for free. So, so, so we reduce one set of laws to a, a very simple assumption. Now, applying this reasoning to Hawking's argument gave a very f famous formula, um, which uh, um, uh, is supposedly going to go on, on Hawking's uh, gravestone, that, that the Entropy, or the information content inside a black hole, is given by the area of the edge of the black hole, the area of the horizon, divided by 4 times Newton's constant times Planck's constant. Now, this is a very strange formula. Usually we get, when electromagnetism was discovered, we have an equation that describes electromagnetism. Newton gave us an equation for gravity. Einstein gave us another equation for gravity. We have equation for the standard model. This is an equation which pulls together all the different areas of physics. Quantum mechanics, gravity, statistical mechanics, and there's a four here, which means it includes math. <laughs> and let me tell you, that four is the most, apartment, most important part of the formula. There's not a squiggly line here, there's an equal and there's a four. And I can't tell you how many times somebody has come up and said, I can explain this formula. I understand where it comes from. And then you say, did you get the four? <laughs> <laughs> and then they look down at their shoes, and usually the answer is no. You know? So it was a very hard formula to, to, to 
understand in a fundamental way. But let me just pause and say that it's huge. So the information content in all the Google data banks could fit inside a black hole, which is 10 to the minus 24 uh, millimeters. It's a huge number. A lot of information in a black hole. And many of us have heard about Moore's Law, which say that, says that the amount of information uh, that you can put on a computer chip of fixed size doubles every three years. And if you calculate it, you find that in 300 years, uh, if Moore's Law continues, that computer chips will have more uh, storage capacity than a black hole could. We believe that's impossible. So at that point, computer chips will be black holes. <laughs> okay. So, if you were paying attention, I said two things which were completely opposite from one another. I told you that black holes were the simplest thing in the, in the universe. They had no features whatsoever. And then I told you that they were the most complicated thing in the universe. And this is the basis of what uh, we, we uh, call the black hole information paradox. And here we have, in trying to understand this, we have the struggle between truth and falsehood. <laughs> and we believe that this one is truth and that this one is falsehood, that black holes are fundamentally complex objects. But many people are still arguing. Their numbers are diminishing. In fact, there are only two left. <laughs> uh, Stephen Hawking himself wrote a famous paper in which he said this was truth and this was falsehood. But he retracted that paper about 20 years later. But there's still some people uh, 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 clinging to this. And, but we, uh, we can't really for sure say they're wrong, but we've learned an awful lot about the problem. So people stared at this and tried to understand how you could store vastly more than the Google data banks in a hole of nothingness without even any space in it. Okay? So that, sat, that problem sat for 25 years. People tried various methods. And then, and then um, string theory came along. And so a quarter century later, String theory, so the advantage of string theory for this problem is string theory has very concrete equations and lots of methods for solving them. And you could sit down and you could say, this looks like a really hard problem, but I'm just going to plow my way through it and count, see if I can account, find where all the complexity lies in a black hole. It was a very algorithmic thing to do. And um, we did it, and we found an answer that agrees exactly with Hawking's result, not just at leading, leading order, but in the whole uh, uh, infinite series. And if we hadn't got that result, that would have been the end of string theory. That would have shown that it was uh, inconsistent. But we did do that description, and the question is, how did string theory manage to store stuff in a hole of nothing? Well. Basically, the black hole has another description in which there's kind of a holographic plate that surrounds it. So it's a little bit like a hologram where you have pixels in a holographic plate, and you shine an image through it, and you get some, you shine laser light through it, you get a three-dimensional image. And a black hole is something like that, where all the information can be thought of as living on the horizon, and the three-dimensional space-time inside the black hole can be reproduced. And the maximally simple and maximally complex descriptions of the black hole were shown to be com uh, complementary but perfectly compatible descriptions. So the idea that you can have completely equivalent descriptions of two things is, of course, ubiquitous in mathematics. They're very simple ones, like 4 equals 3 plus 1 equals 2 plus 2. And then there are insanely complex ones, like the Langlands program, which relates all of number theory to everything in number theory is everything in uh, geometry, which is still a 
a conjecture. So there's some very deep ones, and there's some very simple ones. And the one we needed to understand black holes was a pretty, was a one that in fact hadn't really been fully discovered at the time. And it involves uh, properties showing that it all works perfectly, involve uh, one of Barry's probably his many favorite objects, but when he talks to me, his favorite object is his mock modular forms. He probably has a different favorite object when he talks to everybody. <laughs> but he loves mock modular forms, uh, so it involves mock modular forms to show that this all makes sense. Now this is some progress, but we don't know if the world is described by string theory. And we'd like to see if um, something similar can be seen. To, once you get the idea of how it might work from using string theory, you can see how much of it is operative uh, in the real world. And for that, we turn to a special uh, kind of black hole, which is a simple kind of black hole. They're up there in the sky. Bill, can you tell me what time I started? Um, yeah. You, uh, in, th in theory, have uh, four more minutes. Four more minutes, OK. So um, these extreme curved black holes are very simple because they're spinning around at the speed of light. And uh, there's a maximum amount that a black hole can spin around at. And um, there's a lot of these up in the sky. Here's a picture of one. Um, and this black hole has a symmetry in this region, very near the horizon, uh, that is the same symmetry that we used in the stringy case. So we were able to see some of the features in the real world, enough of the features in the real world uh, that uh, we could uh, see a kind of a hologram appearing. It, there's a video here, there, which I'm going to skip. Um, that right here, we see the emergence of a symmetry near the horizon of a black hole, which enables us, this conformal symmetry, was the key piece of the string theory analysis. The emergence of this special symmetry right at the boundary of nothingness. There's a symmetry which emerges, and some very interesting things happen there. And so we found the same symmetry for these rapidly spinning black holes. And now, now I'm going to go off in some, a different direction. There's this symmetry which is important for understanding this puzzle of black hole. But just at this moment, observational astronomers, they're getting more and more pixels on the sky. So it's just like your TV set. Every year you get 10 times as many pixels. Now the biggest black hole on the sky is the size of an orange in the moon. There's two of them. Sagittarius A star in the middle of our galaxy, and M87, which is a thousand times bigger and a thousand times further away. And all of a sudden, uh, we keep getting more and more pixels. So this year is the year that we're going to have enough pixels that we can image a black hole. And we're expected to get 20 pixels. The data has been taken. It hasn't been analyzed or displayed yet. So we're going to expect to get 20 pixels of the biggest uh, black holes up in the sky. And in order to do that, you need to make a telescope the size of the Earth. <laughs> and they did that. By synchronizing all the radio telescopes on Earth, they had to use atomic clocks and GPS and so on, but they're synchronized with a big web of them. And um, they've been taking data with this. It's all very exciting. Here's a picture of it. One of the six, this is in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile. Um, and here's the black hole. I'm more interested in the farthest one because we know it's spinning at 1% of light speed. So the symmetry I'm seeing that we're talking about, um, we should be able to see it there. So, uh, so the problem now is, to, is for the, the Theorists on Earth, before the data and the image is released sometime in the next year, January's their date, um, to make predictions for what's going to be seen and what the predictions are of this conformal symmetry. 
And so there have been a number of papers on this, but here's our picture. It's a beautiful mathematics goes into constructing this picture because it was well analytic using the symmetry. Uh, I'm gonna, just gonna explain this picture and then I'm gonna at the end. This is how big the black hole is. But you don't see any stars behind it out to this radius because if they get too near the black hole, they get sucked in. These lines, but if you have some light near the black hole, some glowing gases near the black hole, they can escape. So we can see stuff that's near the black hole, not behind it, but near it. This is the North Pole that we're looking down on, where it's spinning, and the symmetry predicts that the polarization of it will form spirals like this. And this line, oddly enough, is the South Pole of the Black Hole. And the reason you can see the South Pole of the Black Hole is because the gravity is so strong, some light rays come out, they skim up the surface of the Black Hole, and then come up. Okay? Then this next thing, what's the next thing? Well, the next thing is where the light rays come and they wind around and then come up. So we get an infinite number of windings, an infinite number of copies of the black holes. I, you know, the resolution of the drawing stops here, but there's an infinite number of, of sequences of, of images of the black holes from light rays that wound any number of, of times. Now, the Fent Horizon Telescope is only going to be have 20 pixels. There's no way to be able to resolve all of that. But uh, we're hoping that, that they see um, some of it. So what about black holes that don't spin? So we're so in some work with, with uh, Hawking and Malcolm Perry. We've found some interesting structure near the horizon of the black hole, uh, some diffeomorphisms that act non-trivially. And we're very excited about that program, but uh, haven't, haven't completed it yet. And the adventure continues. Thank you. OK, we do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, the three papers were uh, absolutely fascinating, and I wouldn't have wanted, as Russian poet Vladimir Mayakovsky said, to step on the throat of their songs. Uh, but uh, if anyone would have a question or a comment, I um, will certainly entertain it. And the answer is that there's been very little formalization uh, of papers analyzing this. There is discussion, however, of the relationship between the idea of externalities and the, the metaphor, both positive externalities, um, which are significantly relevant here. For example, if everyone's speaking the same language or if everyone's on a similar platform, and negative externalities, specifically negative externalities of certain forms of speech. Where it gets hard, and I'll just say it very briefly, where it gets hard is that all speech has negative externalities from the standpoint of a person who disagrees with that speech. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's a negative externality that, that my comment might seem to refute your comment or yours mine. And then there's another form of externality, which is the externality of someone who has the subjective but real experience of feeling marginalized by the content of what I've said. Again, possibly because of the substance. Maybe it's directed at that person, maybe it isn't. And so a lot of the, these approaches grapple with, but haven't really been able to get beyond the, the problem that this marketplace metaphor was developed at a time when externalities was not part of the dominant economic picture. And so externalities taken in their fullest sense are very threatening to the libertarian component of the metaphor. And for some people that's great, and for other people who like the metaphor, it's kind of scary. I think to the, to the approach, the non-American approach, it's really almost every constitutional democracy in the world except the United States, which tends to prohibit certain forms of racist or hate speech, like the speech of the Nazis in, in Skokie. The general view is something like the negative externalities of the speech are so great that they outweigh the benefits that might be accomplished from it. But that, of course, puts you in a realm of having to make an express cost-benefit analysis, and that, in turn, puts you in a position of arguably having to ask about the truth of the speech, which is exactly what the marketplace metaphor wants you, wants you not to do. So there's a potential deep tension between those approaches.
Well, you're completely right that the civic republican conversational metaphor does assume, first of all, cohesiveness as the goal. The idea is that we'll have a conversation and reach some plausible consensus. And I agree, it also requires us to have some trust in the institutions that would make these determinations. Again, maybe that's one reason why Western European democracies are more inclined to adopt these, because there is more of a tradition of trusting the governmental decision maker. With respect to the, the pure marketplace idea, in its original formulation, it was equivocal about this, because on the one hand, the idea was that we should just trust the outcome. You know, the government should step aside and trust the outcome. On the other hand, that potentially leads to extreme consequences. And one of the things that Holmes said in a provocative mode was if the people wish to establish, after freedom of discussion, the dictatorship of the proletariat, they should be free to do so. And of course, the problem with that view is if you do that, then that's the end of the free speech experiment. Holmes's view was, at least rhetorically, that he was prepared to bite the bullet. Um, and that's what the classic free marketplace view sort of says. If, the, if it's an experiment, we're running this experiment, that's our ground principle. But if through that experiment we abandon that principle, so be it.